Welcome everyone to a live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Today we are presenting Jill Heinert on cave diving in Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. We'll begin the program momentarily. If you're having trouble connecting to audio, please use the information seen on the screen. Hi everyone and welcome to a live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Today we are with Jill Heiner who will be presenting on cave diving in Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Before we get started with Jill's presentation, I'm going to introduce Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants who's going to give us a run of today's program. Hi Joe. All right, hey Hannah. Well, thanks so much for that intro, Hannah. As mentioned, my name is Joe Grabowski, and obviously welcome everyone to today's live interaction. Uh, I run an organization called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So I wanna take a minute now uh, just to introduce that to you briefly. So Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So we run virtual field trips, virtual guest speakers, 30 to 50 live uh, events a month for classrooms all over, all 100% free to join in. So if you want to check out the website, it's exploringbytheseat.com, and that'll bring you to the website. You can see our event here up at the top today. Uh, really important as you scroll down to sign up for the newsletter. We send out a few newsletters each month to update you on all the events coming up and how you can register and sign up to join in in a variety of ways. And then we're not doing a whole lot over the summer, but we do have a few events each week, such as uh, Jill's event today, and then tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, Lemur Science 101 with the Duke lemur center so that should be pretty darn cool with today's interaction i also want to share that we are using slido so there's multiple ways you can find it today to join us to take part in some poll questions uh, during the event you can also use this as a spot to send us in some questions uh, during the q a portion so i will watch the slido room i will also watch uh, the q a bar in the go to webinar but you can go to the website it's just sli.do and it'll ask you for an event code. Today's event code is CAVE. There's also this direct link here, which I've put in the chat bar of the GoToWebinar. And if you're quick with your cell phone, I've got a QR code uh, up on the screen. You can scan it right now and you can take part in the poll questions uh, on your cell phone. Those poll questions are open right now. I wanna come back from that screen share. Uh, as mentioned, we get to hang out with Jill Heiner today. It's going to be pretty darn cool. She's amazing. Uh, but I'm going to throw things over to Hannah first, and she's going to talk a little bit about the National Marine Sanctuaries in general. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to take back screen sharing, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So my name is Hannah McDonald. I'm the Education Specialist with the Headquarters Office, but the NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries encompasses over 600,000 square miles of protected marine waters. We have 14 National Marine Sanctuaries and two Marine National Monuments, spanning all the way from Olympic Coast off of Washington State down to the Florida Keys and out in the Pacific to American Samoa. Next, I'm going to take you on a virtual tour, but first, before that, I want to make sure that you have been able to access Slido. So here's where we're going to be making the presentation interactive. I would like to know if you're watching this stream with anybody else, and if so, how many people? So Joe is going to moderate that and let me know how many people are logged into the Slido room, and if All you're right. watching with people. 
Excellent. Let's take a quick look. Looks like a few have found the room so far and the numbers are slowly going up. Let's take a little look at what we have here today. So we have a lot of single viewers, but we do have some groups of two and three tuning in with us today. That's great. And if you are still looking for the Slido room for the interactive portion of today's interaction, it is located in the chat. Joe has dropped the link so you can go find it there. All right. And I have uh, the, the tour is starting now. We are going to start in the most northwest corner in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. Now here you can see the beautiful rugged coastline off of the most northwest part of continental U.S. in Washington State. This National Marine Sanctuary protects kelp forests, deep sea corals, as well as tidal ecosystems like you see here. Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary protects a number of shorebirds that like to pick at the different types of crustaceans that live on the shores in Greater Fairlands. Also lo located in Northern California is Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, where you'll see this crinoid in the deep sea. Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, also located in Northern California. Here we have an elephant seal. Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is the last sanctuary in California, located 30 miles off the shore of Santa Barbara. We're going to be learning so much more from Jill today on Channel Islands and the caves that are there. So I'll leave a lot of that up to her. Going further west, we have Papahānaumokuākea Marine National Monument, which is one of the largest marine conservation areas in the world. As you can see, it protects some of the most charismatic marine species like this Hawaiian monk seal and green sea turtle. Hawaiian Islands humpback whale protects uh, breeding humpback whales, as you can see here. The National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa is located even further into the Pacific, and it protects one of the largest known coral heads in the world called Big Mama. Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary is about 100 nautical miles off the coast of Galveston, Texas. So we're bringing it back to continental US and protects a abundance of coral reef ecosystems and various banks. Here we have a moray eel. Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary protects the Florida Keys reef track. Here we, you can see a ray amongst the reefs. Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary protects another reef ecosystem, as well as here we have a loggerhead sea turtle. Monitor National Marine Sanctuary is the very first National Marine Sanctuary that was established, and it protects the USS Monitor, a Civil War era shipwreck. So we're going from our very first National Marine Sanctuary on this tour off of North Carolina, to our most recent National Marine Sanctuary, Mallows Bay Potomac River, located in the waters of the Potomac River in Maryland. This National Marine Sanctuary protects the Ghost Fleet, which is a bunch of shipwrecks partially sh submerged in the Potomac River from World War I and World War II. Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is located in Massachusetts Bay, a great place for both bird watching and whale watching. And Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is located in Lake Huron off of Michigan in the Great Lakes, and it protects over 200 shipwrecks. So now that we've done a little virtual tour, I would like to know if any of you have visited a National Marine Sanctuary. So if you wanna answer this question, it's over in the Slido room, which is down in the chat. So if you wanna click on the link in the chat and then type your answer in Slido, I'll see what Joe says is coming in. All right. Well, we are crushing it today. I think we have a lot of returners from some of our past sessions. We have 96% uh, reporting that they have heard of the National Marine Sanctuaries before. That is fantastic. And is that the have heard question? I think I missed a slide on that one. So I w I'm wondering if people have now visited. Has okay. that question been posted too? That one's up there too, and we're at a 65-35 split. Oh, awesome. That's great. So 96%, that's a ton of you that have heard of sanctuaries before, and I'm thrilled to hear that. And 65% of you that have visited, you have been very lucky. I'm hoping that Jill will give us a sense of place of what it's like to visit the caves of Channel Islands through her presentation today. 
Before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit more about what National Marine Sanctuaries do. So we protect things like the sea giants, the whale sharks that live in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, to the small sea life like reef fish that live on reefs like the shipwreck reef on Monitor. We protect places with abundant biodiversity. We provide places of shelter for some of the most incredible marine species. And we protect maritime heritage, like you've noticed with Monitor, Mallows Bay, and Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So we are providing resource protection to save these places for generations to come. And we want to save these places so that people like you can enjoy them. These are very special marine places that we want you to be able to paddle in, to fish in, to snorkel in, to boat in, to surf in. These places are truly yours. And with that, I wanna introduce you to Jill Heinert. She's a cave diver and explorer in residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And she's also an author. She's participated in various films. She has an incredible portfolio and is one of the best divers in the world. So I'm thrilled to announce her and truly someone who has been able to get into your sanctuary. So Jill, I am going to change over the presenter to you and you will be what? able to share your screen. Okay, now uh, show my screen. Okay, and let me bring up the presentation. Just so everyone knows, we were having a little trouble uh, allowing you to see me. So, <laughs> but that's okay because I know you came here really to see my images instead. So, uh, so you'll uh, you'll be able to see those. Um, can you see that, Hannah? Yep, that looks great. Okay, awesome. I'm going to share with you uh, what uh, type of work we're doing in the caves in the Channel Islands. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of context uh, for the exploration and survey work that we're doing and the technologies that we're using. So my specialty is cave diving all over the world in places where you might not imagine we would find caves and uh, unusual water bodies. And most of the time I am collaborating with scientists, acting as a documentarian, taking photos and underwater video that supports their work in these absolutely beautifully stunning environments. And a lot of people can't even imagine, you know, what is an underwater cave, but these are water filled passages beneath your feet. So I'm swimming into an overhead environment that branches out in conduits like the branches of a tree. I also do uh, work deep diving in ocean environments as well. And to do all of my work, I do need quite a bit of equipment. And I, I realize that the equipment that I wear probably looks a lot more like an astronaut's spacesuit than dive gear. But this allows us the range and the depth to do some pretty exciting exploration work. Cave divers have come a long way in their documentation work. Um, what you're seeing here is an open circuit diver. So someone who breathes in and then exhales and makes bubbles, um, where these days I am using a rebreather that recirculates my gas. Um, and so I don't even make bubbles when I'm underwater. So what do we do on these projects? We have many scientific objectives, including finding targets, interpreting data, documenting things underwater, sometimes recovering objects and preserving them, uh, and then sharing data with scientists. So what does that mean? Uh, first of all, we have to find things. And uh, here's an example for you. We use sometimes side scan sonar in open water to find things like shipwrecks. And this is something that we might tow behind a boat. And we call it mowing the lawn because you're literally towing it behind the boat in long stretches, turning around and coming back, turning around and coming back, and getting an image that looks like this, if you're lucky, to find a shipwreck. And this shipwreck is actually in what will be the newest uh, NOAA Marine Sanctuary in Lake Ontario. And here's uh, first pictures of uh, this particular shipwreck that I shot. 
So we have to interpret the data that we um, get from these side scan uh, images. And just to give you an example, uh, on the upper right, you're looking at what we would see and you see all kinds of black dots in the colorful bands and the colorful bands show you the depth. The black dots are like a gap in the data. And if you look in that sort of center lower picture, what you're actually seeing is either an overhang or a cave. Um, and so we're getting a, a void in the return. So when we find this kind of data and we see these steep locations and, and potential you know, black spots that might be uh, overhangs or caves, we go and we look for them. Uh, and usually that means sending somebody down. We also find other things when we side scan uh, 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 using sort of more, more advanced side scan sonars, we find things like shipwrecks. Full, full shipwrecks in, in all their glory besides the caves. Now, uh, when we document things in the cave, what that means is we have to first travel to a location, like here is a cave in Cuba. Sometimes we have to uh, make long journeys through the dry portions of the cave, and then eventually get to a point where we can get in the water. So we're already pretty remote, and then we're diving into the water, swimming deep into the cave system, following branching conduits and complex navigation until we find some point of interest. Like in this case, this is an extinct sloth that is very much a part of the substrate of the cave. And we want to bring back this information to scientists because we know it's important to them. In the past, we would take photographs with a scale, and for me, as an artist, sometimes I would sketch the things that we see. We also traditionally map these spaces using compasses and guideline and measuring tapes to create a map of the cave itself and where we found the objects. And today, we are also scanning objects. So this is the skull of that extinct sloth. And we couldn't have brought it out of the cave because it was really embedded in the, in the substrate. So what we do is very high resolution photographs and assemble those as a 3D model so that we can send a scientist data to look at instead of an object itself. Now, sometimes we are asked to recover or preserve um, uh, for preservation an artifact. And um, in some cases, like with a shipwreck, for example, we might bring up uh, something like a sextant. And just to give you a sense of what it takes to do this, first of all, you have to take or get a permit. So the permit could take a couple of years and whether that's for an object or for live material, it can take a long time to get a permit. And then we have a very careful plan for recovering something so that it's not damaged. Because you can imagine some of these objects, like this human skull, for instance, are not just incredibly fragile, but they're very, very important artifacts and very difficult to conserve, expensive to conserve. But in the past, we have been asked to bring an artifact like this Lucayan skull back to the surface to a paleontologist who will study it. And um, they have the challenge of conserving it over a long period of time. But these finds can be very significant and may include materials that are completely extinct, like this crocodile from a Bahamian cave. But if they're not properly conserved, then you might find a note like this, <laughs> where you know your object is starting to smell bad. Right? So we employ new technologies um, the whole scanning process in order to bring the data instead of the object to the science in much more detail. And when we can bring them the data, we can bring them the context for the object, like where it was, how it was sitting on the ground, um, what other things were nearby the object. Uh, and then we can provide this data in a very compelling way to many scientists at the same time around the world so that they can study an object simultaneously. So we scan these areas to show them, you know, pottery beside bone, beside other things. And we can provide the scientist with a model of the cave system, the shelf where we found all these materials. And then they can review these using a Microsoft HoloLens and experience these assets in a holographic manner. So here's what that looks like.
So that was a, a 3D, uh, sorry, an augmented reality um, asset that we scanned inside the cave and then projected through those uh, hollow lenses so that people could, could view it in its full regalia. Now, uh, the next thing we do is extensive survey and mapping of cave systems. And this slide is actually a photograph of a mapping device that my colleague, Dr. Bill Stone, developed back in 1998, uh, and that I had an opportunity to drive through a very deep system in Florida in order to map the cave in three dimensions. Again, it requires quite a significant amount of life support and additional equipment that we swim through the cave in order to make these maps. Meanwhile, we also have technology that allows us to locate these caves from top side so that we can marry a cave map with what lies above the surface. And these maps are absolutely amazing because we can map a cave no matter what the visibility of the water is. Whether I can see the walls, the floors, or the ceiling, the sonar mapper can see it and create this point cloud data. And this mapping device has come a long way since then. This is the Sunfish Mapper, and it is now uh, not needing me to drive it through the cave system. It can actually go and explore the cave on its own. So we can set it loose into the cave. It's artificially intelligent, has its own brain. Um, it can make decisions to turn left or right. It will map the cave as it swims through, and we can attach a tether to it if we want to monitor what it's doing, but we're not actually sending instructions to it. It's doing its own thing. Now, all of this comes together in the Southern California continental borderlands, which are in the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, meaning that under very uh, different sea level conditions, this would have been the edge of the west coast of the Americas. So, uh, in the Channel Islands uh, National Marine Sanctuary, we have several goals. We are investigating submerged caves and ancient shorelines that were carved by the sea um, sometime in the last 19,000 years under lower sea level stands. So if you have not had a chance to visit this uh, National Marine Sanctuary, there's where we are just off of Oxnard, uh, California. Uh, in the islands and we uh, get on a boat and we go out uh, to the islands to do our work. So we're also working on the Osborne Bank a little bit further uh, out than those islands you just saw. So in different sea level stands, the water was much lower than it was today, and we find evidence of waves crashing against the shoreline, creating like terraces or ledges, and also exploiting cracks within the rock to create caves. And we find these locations 10, 35, 70, 100, 110, and 120 meters deep. So we have evidence of cave formation in all of those locations below uh, the water levels today. And here's why we're really interested. We're interested because these caves could have been locations of former human occupation. And uh, we're very interested in seeing if we might find artifacts or even human remains in some of these locations that are you know, 10 to 120 meters below uh, present sea level. So we use um, a lot of different technologies and this work began in 2016 before I got there with some other equipment uh, uh, involved in the exploration. And here's sort of a side view of the locations that they're trying to get us information on. So these former ledges, that's what it looks like underwater. So to date, uh, we've done some of the, the, the shallowest caves and we're working our way uh, deeper and deeper with each excursion when we go out there. Today, if you go to the Channel Islands, um, what you'll see is the waves crashing against the shore and where there are fissures and cracks, um, you will see caves at sea level. So the waves pound against these cracks. And if you're on the inside looking out, the wave action actually um, you know, comes far into the cave. It literally, like a pile driver, aids in cave formation. And some of these sea caves are quite extensive at today's current sea level. 
this is Painted Cave, and you could drive a boat right into Painted Cave. So in 2013, uh, Bob Ballard's team began uh, with several different strategies. First, um, uh, an ROV that could uh, swim down and do a lot of different tasks. So it could uh, take photographs, it could collect samples, it could help with the uh, sonar surveys. And this is what Hercules looks like underwater when it's uh, looking at a German U-boat wreck. And this is Hercules in the cavern zone. But this device is on the end of a tether and things that are tethered don't do well in caves. They get entangled and can't find their way out. And then we end up having to send divers to rescue them. So tethered ROVs just don't seem to work out. Another device that they used in the 2017 explorations is an autonomous surface vehicle that could really give us some detailed bathymetry. So that's uh, like an underwater image again of very detailed um, elevations in essence. And that again would help us to pick target locations that you can see with these white dots and give us a good sense of the steepness of, of slopes underwater so that we can get an idea of, of where we should look. And this bathymetry is, is quite compelling. It's, it gives us a lot of information. But ultimately, we have to go a little bit deeper and we have to send a diver down to confirm, is this just a small overhang or is this actually a cave? And how far into the planet does the cave go? So divers go down, we're using rebreathers to give us uh, an extended range. And we literally take a reel like you see in this photograph and run it into the cave so that we have a, a guideline to act as our, our safety so that if we lose visibility, we can hold onto the guideline and come out of the cave just hanging onto that guideline. Once we've established a guideline, we can use a very simple device where we used to have to use a measuring tape and um, and estimate distances, but now we have this device uh, made by Sebastian Kister. It's called Nemo, and we can run it along the guideline, and it'll take our compass bearing and measure the distances between our stations and help us slowly to develop a rudimentary model of the cave conduits itself. And that can be extremely handy as we're also testing other new technologies and we want to overlay our maps and see, well, which is doing the best job for us. So some of our work is this comparative work of, is a cave survey done traditionally better? Is Nemo better? Or some of these advanced technologies, are they working out better for us? This is Christina Zanotto running a line into one of the caves in the Channel Islands. And here she is actually using the Nemo device on the line to measure. And as we're doing our measuring work, we're also finding all kinds of cool stuff like leopard sharks tucked away on the uh, shelves in the caves. There are animals inside these cave systems, both encrusting the walls and the floor and the ceiling, but also animals that use these spaces for habitat. So when we make a plan, we sit down as a team, uh, this is Bob Ballard and Kenny Broad, and, uh, and then we you know, break into groups to use these different technologies. We took Sunfish on our last cruise uh, down uh, to see what it could do. And when we first deployed Sunfish, this was the first time that it had been in the ocean in a location where we, it would experience heavy surge and currents. And we weren't sure how its thrusters were going to manage. We did at first run this cable to Sunfish so that we could see what it was doing while it was making its decisions. And we would launch it off the back of the boat with a team of divers that would follow close behind and sort of manage that tether so it didn't become entangled or become a problem. But again, like I mentioned, tethers don't do well in caves. They get entangled and we end up with a big, a big mess that we have to clean up. And so uh, we sort of came up with a new idea uh, uh, and this is Christoph uh, Richmond and uh, Bob Ballard. And the new idea was to put a fiber optic spool, a self spooling mechanism that would spool out this very, very tiny fish line kind of thickness fiber optic cable into the cave. 
And then we were able to just launch Sunfish off the back deck without any assistance. And we gave it the instruction to find a cave and map a cave. And it swam along the shoreline, found an opening, went into the cave, and then delivered us a map. And then when it was done, it turned itself off. We fetched it. Um, and then in later dives, we actually had uh, instructed it to just finish the job and come back unaided to the boat on its own. So it was really exciting to move from a heavy tether to a fiber optic to completely autonomous operation when it would uh, return to base without any instructions. But there were some in-between times when <laughs> we had to uh, collect some, uh, some of that cable and fiber optics and, and bring it home. But these caves are, are quite remarkable and, uh, and challenging, and there's probably a lifetime of work left to do there. We're also working with the MIT Future Ocean Lab, and they are designing a series of devices that they hope will help um, deliver high quality sampling devices in a much more ubiquitous fashion. So this device that we're testing here is called Prometheus, and it has a different strategy for mapping the cave. It's using um, basically the time of return of light pulses sent into the environment, the time of return from when they bounce off the walls and they can measure the speed of light from when it comes back to the device and then uh, create a LIDAR-like map of the cave system. But the difference between this and the multi-million dollar you know, sunfish is they hope to make this Prometheus device you know, more like something that would be in the seven, several thousand dollar range and would be much more affordable to more scientists. They're also developing sense, sensors and many other tools that might be able to be you know, built into a dive watch or into a boat or even a diver's pair of fins, anything that goes in and out of the water so that we could get measurements like you know, temperature, depth, conductivity, flow, things like that, um, that could be sampled just by someone going swimming and not having to take any action directly at all when they return to the surface, those devices could be um, keyed in a way that they would immediately send the telemetry back to MIT, where it would be gathered in a public database. So there's quite a lot um, for us to do. And uh, if, if COVID allows, <laughs> we'll be back there in a couple of months. We're, we're going to have to go and potentially quarantine for two weeks in California before getting on the boat and then do our project and then quarantine when we get back to, to Canada again. So we're just trying to figure out whether that's going to be logistically possible or not. But the next step is to go back and do some of these deeper caves uh, in the uh, over 200 foot deep range. And um, that being some of the older sea level stands is a location where we expect uh, that we could potentially find um, evidence of former human occupation. So it's incredibly exciting the things uh, that we can do in locations like this and um, and it happens only because of, of you know myriad sponsors from the uh, marine sanctuaries themselves, the Osh Office of Naval Research, National Geographic, and then in my case, you know, personal sponsors that um, help to support me with uh, gear and equipment to get these sort of things done. So I am going to pass back the screen sharing, uh, stop uh, showing my screen, so that we can answer some questions because I think there's probably gonna be a lot of discussion and, and questions about what we're finding or how we um, do this sort of work. And anything goes, there's uh, no stupid questions. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so let's entertain anything that anyone wants to ask. And just as a reminder, you can send in those questions both in the control panel on GoToWebinar and in the Slido room, and the link for that is in the chat. Thank you so much, Jill, for that presentation. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's get to some of that Q&A action, Jill. So yeah, our first question here is from Stephanie, and she would like you to go a little deeper into why recirculating your air is important or beneficial. Mm. Sure. So when you use a scuba tank, you inhale from the tank and you exhale and make bubbles. And you're wasting a lot of um, very precious oxygen molecules. With a rebreather, we can recapture all of that exhaled gas. We can scrub it clean of carbon dioxide and then re-inject oxygen 
uh, in order to make up for what the body has metabolized. With a regular scuba tank, the deeper you go, the faster you'll use your gas because of the effects of pressure. Each inhalation is going to be a much greater density of gas. And so to do deep diving, we would need to use many, many tanks, 10 tanks. Even some of the deep dives I've done could require hundreds of tanks of gas. But a rebreather can be worn by a diver and we can wear bail out. So if we have an emergency, if the rebreather fails, we can bail to open circuit. But if everything goes well, then we can use a very, very small volume of gas to go deep and far into a cave and um, conserve our resources. So that's a great question. Thank you so much for that. All right. We've got a few more practical questions about the gear. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw a two-parter at you here, Jill. Michelle would like to know, um, what are some ways you keep from getting lost? And then Connie wants to know, it looks like a lot of gear. Do you find any difficulty swimming when you're maneuvering uh, mm -hmm. through the caves? Yeah. So uh, in order to not get lost, that's why we lay the guideline through the cave. And when the cave gets to be complicated, like the branches of a tree, we might have multiple guidelines happening. But we use a, a very simple low-tech uh, triangular marker that weaves into the line and points the direction out of the cave so that we always know which way is out, both visually, but if we lost all of our visibility and we were completely in the dark, we could put our hand on the guideline and as you run your hand on the guideline, you bump into the arrows that tell you the way home. So whether we can see or not, we can get out of the cave. And then of course, I see the future with working with something like Sunfish. If um, Sunfish is exploring and making a map as it goes in, it follows its own map out. So I hope one day I'll have that sort of technology on my wrist and that my computer might guide me back out of the cave. Oh, and the second question you had was, isn't it hard to swim with all that stuff? So I have swam with as much as five to 600 pounds of equipment on my body, but we uh, design all of that equipment to be neutrally buoyant. And I'll tell you, sometimes that's challenging. Like as we were developing, um, uh, well, as, as MIT was working on Prometheus, I actually went down to Boston uh, to work in a swimming pool with the developers to help them trim and balance Prometheus. Because it's one thing to create a device that might be able to map in the cave, but if it weighs too much, I can't swim it. And if it's really bulky or tough to push through the water, I can't swim it. And I need to be able to swim a nice smooth pattern to make a nice map. So I spent a few days in the swimming pool helping them um, to decide, you know, how big does the airspace need to be inside the housing in order to float this? Or do we need to trim it with little lead weights in order to make it level? And that happens with every single piece of scuba gear that we dive so that we're actually capable of, of swimming it. All right. So Zane and Bob are both curious. Uh, this question is coming from the Slido room. They both like to know um, how long can you stay in a cave? So maybe mm -hmm. what's what's your longest time in a cave? Yeah, so my longest underwater uh, mission was on uh, a project using the first iteration of the mapper, and that was a 22-hour mission. Uh, I was actually underwater for about 12 hours of that and then in a pressurized habitat to finish my uh, my decompression to get home. Most of my dives would be in the one to three hour range, but a deeper decompression dive, it's really not unusual to be in the five to six hour range for some of those. All right. We've got Elva tuning in with us and Elva would like to know, can you add sensors to Sunfish or Prometheus to capture some environmental variables while it's mapping? Or does it have it already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely the plan. Um, so uh, Bill Stone's uh, mappers have progressed, obviously, since that first one that I was uh, driving at Wakulla Springs to Sunfish today. And so he's had different iterations of that that have had different sensing capabilities. It's really easy for us to do things like temperature, depth, conductivity, um, that sort of stuff, but he's even had some that have had little manipulator arms so that, you know, if Sunfish's artificial intelligence, you know, ticks a few boxes that might uh, indicate life or something, it might be able to take a sample. 
Uh, and so those are the kinds of, of things that we, we look forward to building into all of these devices in the future and then also into, into things that people wear into the water so that we can turn everybody into a citizen scientist. Okay. Um, now uh, we've got a question here. John. John uh, is very curious about is there a place you'd recommend or somewhere to start if you want to start training uh, to do some of the underwater work that you do? Yeah, uh, so scuba divers have to do a lot of extra um, training programs before that they can become a cave diver. So you do things like advanced scuba, rescue diver, um, uh, nitrox diver, deep diver, all of those things are prerequisites, decompression procedures, and then you take a cave diving program. And then you need to, of course, get experience in between each of those steps. So it is a it is a long process, um, but and it requires a lot of uh, currency practice um, and real dedication. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of programs out there. There's lots of mentors out there as well. Okay. So I'm gonna grab another question here from Butterfly O'Shea, and they're mm -hmm. curious, maybe, uh, you know, they're kind of sitting at home and, and looking at what you're doing, and they're wondering um, what, um, or sorry, this is actually Amelia, I've got another question from Butterfly that's coming up. But Amelia wants to know, what, why go so deep into the earth? Why, mm -hmm. why just keep pushing further and further? Mm -hmm. Well, I look at underwater caves as one of the last frontiers for exploration on our planet. I mean, we know more about space than we do about inner space and our deep oceans right now. So these are spaces that are incredibly important to understand. You know, caves are virtually museums of natural history. We can learn about things like climate change in these spaces. We can find the remains of past civilizations and the bones of extinct animals. So caves are a source of great fascination. Then there's the biology of what lives in these caves. The animals are so unique that live in the darkness of these caves that they may teach us about evolution and survival or provide the materials for future bioprospecting, chemicals, pharmaceuticals. Um, so I'm very excited to have and privileged really to have an opportunity to go to places that nobody's ever been before and bring back the information to the right scientists who I can collaborate with and uh, and they can tell us the significance of these findings. Very cool. So sliding back into the Slido room, Jubilee, Verity and Smari would like to know uh, that 22 hour mission, did you sleep at all? <laughs> Uh, I did not sleep on, on that mission. Uh, I was certainly tired because um, that took like an entire day to prepare the equipment. It took uh, hours and hours and hours even to get through the pre-dive checks and get fully dressed in the water because that was one of those dives with the five to 600 pounds of gear and each little component has to be tested for safety and checked before going into the cave. Then there's the mission. And then when you come out, you have to go through a period of time where you're being closely watched by the safety team before they declare that you're not gonna you know, pass out or <laughs> have a decompression sickness yet. <laughs> but we do eat underwater. And a lot of people ask me about what we eat. And uh, sometimes chocolate bars, sometimes chocolate milk in a drink box is really uh, satisfying. <laughs> chocolate, there's a theme there, I think. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, we've got a question that came in from Hannah. And Hannah, do you just want to ask that question live? Since you're yeah. Here? So I actually think that someone is pretending to be me because I saw oh. that too. Or there's someone with the same name. I was like, hmm, I wonder who that is. Um, but I can surely read it off. What type of scientists do you work with to report your human and animal remain findings? Oh, wow. Uh, archaeologists and paleontologists, um, normally with um, like the National Archaeological Institution with the particular country. So like in Mexico, there's an organization called INA. We work with them. Um, it's very important when we're working in a foreign country to be collaborating with scientists from that country um, so that they are, you know, fully participating. And especially when it comes down to human remains. I mean, obviously, uh, it used to be extremely disturbing to me um, to be asked to actually bring 
you know, human remains out of a cave because that was somebody's burial. So I'm so much happier just bringing the data to people now and knowing that the, uh, the human remains are staying exactly where they belong. Um, you know, when it comes to animals, like live animals, I work with different biologists um, who specialize in specific cave adapted species, as well as um, scientists that um, specialize in, in particular um, uh, animals like, well, for instance, I think Andre Martel is probably on the call right now listening. He's a malacologist that um, specializes in bivalves, mussels, and uh, I'm doing some work with him extending his eyes and hands into a cave in Canada. Um, so I'll take pictures and bring him uh, data of what I'm seeing of the mussels within the cave system. All and right. I also wanted to note that we've had a few questions come in from an attendee who seems to be a scientist interested in partnering with you. So it seems like you do a oh, lot yeah. of networking to get this research <laughs> done. And this webinar yeah. is increasing that. So awesome. I'll connect with following this. Yeah, great. And anybody that wants to connect with me, I mean, always feel free to reach out to me on my website at intotheplanet.com. Um, there's a contact form there and, uh, and uh, I'd love to chat. All right. So Melanie's got a good question here. Melanie wants to know, um, have changes in the environment, maybe an algal, algal bloom, oil spill, ocean current, uh, have they changed your plans for a dive? Mm, what a wonderful question. Um, yeah, we see a lot of evidence. I mean, you can imagine when I'm in an underwater cave, I am swimming through the veins of Mother Earth. I mean, sometimes I'm in you know, ocean water, like in, in the Channel Islands, but sometimes I'm in your drinking water. And we do see evidence of change in these caves. So um, certainly the caves you can think of as being the beginning of the pipe. So a freshwater cave, for instance, might dump into a spring, the spring feeds a river, the river feeds an estuary, the estuary feeds the ocean. So everything is connected. Sometimes we use dye tracing. So uh, we will put a a special dye into the water upstream so we can see where it comes out and and that helps us to track things like a spill or a contamination um, and yet also it's important to know that when rain falls on the surface of the earth and it soaks into the ground and then ends up in cave systems it gets filtered to a degree but not everything gets filtered out of the water column so the water coming out of caves might have a high level of nitrates from agricultural fields it might have um, pharmaceuticals birth control pills antidepressants um, you know we can detect all of these things in the water column and uh, and that helps us to understand where they're coming from and where they're going to next okay so this might be a question on a few uh, people's mind, especially if they're new to something like cave diving. So Debbie's curious about precautions or what you would do if something went wrong while you were mm -hmm. in, a, in a cave. Yeah, so we train very heavily for um, cave diving and we practice. So we practice drills over and over again so that we're fresh. And um, that way when something happens, we know what to do. Before a dive, I will think about all the things that could go wrong and I'll do a last minute rehearsal so that if something startling happens, like suddenly I have a major equipment failure, I know how to respond. So there's the, you know, the motor control of, of actions that I have to take to save myself, but there's also the mental control. I have to be able to take a deep breath and clear the fear away. So take a deep breath to slow down my heart, slow down my respirations, and then just focus on very small pragmatic steps, the next best thing to solve a problem or get me safely home. All right. So this might be, you know, akin to asking somebody, you know, say who their favorite child is, but Delta 21 wants to know what the most beautiful cave you were ever in mm. was. Gosh, it's a hard choice. I, I absolutely love Dan's cave in the Bahamas, but also some of the caves that I saw in Bermuda um, absolutely blew my mind. All right, very, very cool. So I'm gonna swing back to that question from Butterfly O'Shea this time. And where can you go to follow along, um, find more information if, if people wanna dive deeper into, into you? Oh, wow. Yeah, my website, uh, intotheplanet.com, or 
Uh, I actually have a book, uh, which is my memoir. Uh, it's also called Into the Planet, My Life as a Cave Diver. And you can get that on uh, Amazon uh, in hardcover, ebook, or audiobook if you want to hear me narrate <laughs> narrate my life story. Um, but yeah, check, check either of those out. I've dropped the link to intotheplanet.com in the chat too. So you can click on it directly from the GoToWebinar control panel chat. Great, yeah. And uh, YouTube, of course, as well. I have quite a few videos on, on YouTube you can find. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, so uh, first uh, comment here from, oh, there it is. Soul Wolf says chocolate is good, so they clearly like your choice <laughs> of snacks uh, for yeah. underwater. And then Phyllis, Phyllis would like to know, if you have data about previous sea levels, could you calculate the length of time that humans were using those caves? Um, yeah, so that's not my area of specialty, but certainly um, certainly they, they can. Um, we can find a, out about like the age of caves in, in some interesting ways. Um, if you uh, were watching the news a couple of weeks ago, you've seen Sahara dust storms coming across the Atlantic Ocean and raining down on the Caribbean and even on parts of the United States. Well, that tends to happen uh, in very uh, dry times on planet Earth at lower sea levels. And we can actually find the remains of that Sahara dust inside the formations inside underwater caves. And by matching that up with ice core data and other you know known climate uh, references uh, that can help us to tell um, like when a particular cave was was dry and how old it was and and for how long it was dry and then from there i guess we can infer that there's a potential that humans might have been using these spaces in some of those time frames all right uh, another good question here from the slido room if you didn't use a rebreather would the gas coming out, could it damage the roof of the cave? Could it alter the chemistry of the cave? Yeah, wonderful question. Yes. Uh, so there are some caves that are extraordinarily delicate uh, in the world where we've actually banned the use of traditional open circuit scuba gear for that reason exactly because the bubbles hit the ceiling and then things rain down from the ceiling so the ceiling is is physically damaged and changed and we do of course change the water chemistry so rebreathers are are preferable when we can use them now these caves um, especially the shallow ones here are getting so much water flow exchange that the ocean's doing like a pile driver of damage <laughs> <laughs> Every time a wave crashes on the shoreline, the the surge in these shallow caves in the Channel Islands is so strong that it's it's literally moving us 50 or 60 feet at a time, and it's the the surge we can actually feel it in the air spaces in our body. So we feel it in our middle ear. We can feel the pounding of the waves in our chests even when we're far back in the cave and <laughs> It makes us seasick from time to time, all this waving back and forth out of control. So there, there are a few of us that actually uh, got seasick while diving in these caves just due to the surge. Okay, so let's squeeze in one more question here. Uh, Jill, when you're checking out these caves, what kind of marine life uh, do you see in the caves? And are there any endemic species? So in the Channel Islands, uh, there's quite a bit of marine life, like coating the walls. Um, so there's, you know, there's sponges, there's coralline algae, there's all kinds of things coating the walls. Um, and then there's fish that come and go, and there's sharks that come and go, uh, even rays that come and go. So quite, quite a lot of uh, animal activity in these spaces. Um, and oh sorry my, my phone's ringing in the background that's me <laughs> um yeah so uh animals will go far back into the cave system and um some come and go some live in the darkness of an underwater cave through their entire life cycle and we have not found endemic species in the channel islands yet but we really have not done a lot of work on the biology yet in those caves there's so much to do there's a lifetime of work down there all right very cool so definitely something especially for some of our younger viewers who are thinking about getting into science and exploration sounds like there's lots uh, still left to discover especially in just one part of the ocean let alone 
uh, the, mm -hmm. the ocean as a whole. Well, Jill, thank you so much for taking us on some adventures today. Thanks for taking us into your world and, of course, into the Channel Island National uh, Marine Sanctuary. I'm going to pass things back over to Hannah, um, and she's going to take over for a bit. Yeah, thank you so much, both Jill and Joe, for today's wonderful live interaction. Uh, Jill, you are a wealth of knowledge, and you've excited so many of our attendees today with cave diving. So I'm thrilled that we had such a great question and answer session. Um, nice. I want to do a little bit of wrap up. Our live interactions with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants are recorded and broadcasted on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube channel. There you'll find a NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries playlist where you're able to watch all of our previous recordings. We have upcoming programs with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants as well. We have a cross-country voyage through public waters to National Marine Sanctuaries with Hispanic Access Foundation. Now, this is next week in honor of Latino Conservation Week. So we're super excited about this one. And then we're switching back over to some recreation in National Marine Sanctuaries with Paddling Shipwrecks, Adventures in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, where we're going to be bringing on a paddleboarder and the research coordinator to talk about what it's like to paddle over shipwrecks. If you're interested in other live interactions like this one, we have the National Marine Sanctuary live interactions for students. That's this series that you're attending now. If you're interested in other sanctuary featured webinars, we have the National Marine Sanctuary's webinar series tailored for educators. I'd also love to highlight Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. They do many more live interactions outside of NOAA partners that bring in explorers and scientists from all fields and all over the world. So I definitely suggest you check out their page and see what interactions you can connect with. And then NOAA Ocean Today also offers um, live webinars. Their next one will be August 3rd, and it will actually be featuring Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So check out oceantoday.noaa.gov to check out their deeper dive series. And with that, I would like to encourage you all and any adult that's participating to check out the NOAA Multimedia and Distance Learning Survey. We really appreciate your feedback as it helps us guide what topics and how we format our webinar series. With that, I want to send one more huge thank you to Jill and Joe for both tuning in to today's live interaction and making it super engaging for all of our attendees. And I'd also love to thank all of the attendees for being so excited about this presentation. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. My pleasure.